Um, so the shaded areas are the Gaeltacht, the, the areas where um, Irish is spoken as a community language still and by a lot of people in their homes. And there are three major dialect areas uh, in the case of Irish. There's the Ulster dialect area, the Connacht dialect area, and then the Munster uh, dialect area. And we've been gathering data from all three dialects. Today we have data from uh, mostly from Connacht and uh, one uh, Ulster speaker. So this is what the um, phoneme inventory looks like. Uh, and the important thing to see is simply that this contrast pervades the entire phoneme inventory. So uh, here's what it looks like. Uh, you, you have the contrast uh, word initially. Uh, so pairs like tus beginning versus tus thickness um, before u or before e, uh, it's the velarization that really stands out. So we versus b. Also happens word finally in Irish. So broad uh, versus broad. Uh, and even um, is used pretty extensively to mark grammatical or morphosyntactic distinctions, as in uj, genitive versus ud, nominative. And uh, just highlighting that we are marking velarization in all non palatalized consonants. So velarization isn't realized in some uh, monolithically uniform way across uh, the consonants, but for that matter, neither is palatalization. Velarization is. Um, a really pervasive property of non-palatalized consonants in Irish. So we mark it all the time. Uh, so this is from our 2018 uh, study uh, where we were looking only at um, consonants and onset position. And just showing um, with these, um, these are SSNOVA curves, I guess. Um, the front of the mouth is on the right, uh, the back is on the left. Uh, the palatalized is the uh, dashed line and the velarized is the not dashed line. I'm colorblind, so I'm I'm skirting the colors. Uh, but this just shows that, um, you know, the, the kind of expected difference with the tongue fronter and uh, in this case, slightly higher uh, in the case of the palatalized consonants. And uh, this is a consistent fact across place, manner, and vowel context. So here we're seeing it before ooh, uh, so I'll go back up. This is before E. This is before U. I don't think that difference in height is very meaningful. Um, we we see some variation in the height distinction. Um, but if there is a difference, more often the palatalized consonants are higher. And this is uh, in the case of F. So just showing it for a fricative instead of a stop uh, before U. So very consistent um, across all consonants. And this is S. Now, um, the uh, the coronals are velarized, but uh, the velarization is less spectacular than for the other places of articulation. That's especially true for S. Uh, 
Um, and that might be related to the fact that in Irish, the palatalized S becomes a sh, and um, that might, uh, it's possible that that really bears the, the brunt of the, the distinction nowadays. Uh, this is the velar fricative, so hu versus hu, but again, um, pretty consistent differences. There's also, um, depending on the dialect, uh, there can be differences that correlate with this based on lip rounding. So um, uh, what you're seeing in these violin plots uh, are uh, differences uh, where the, um, the lip rounding is greater in the velarized consonants pretty much across all of these uh, consonant types with the exception of S. So that might be related to what I said before. So let's talk about the typological symmetries in a little more depth. So previous work has documented these two um, asymmetries and the occurrence of palatalization contrasts. Uh, first, they, they um, can be dispreferred in syllable quotas compared to onsets, never the other way around. So while Russian, for example, is like Irish and having the contrast in, uh, across consonants and in both positions, Bulgarian um, does not have the contrast in quota position. And it can be dispreferred in labials uh, compared to coronals. So Czech is a language that has lost the contrast in the case of labials. Uh, and you can see the interaction of these things in um, Belarusian, which uh, allows uh, coronals to be palatalized in, on, in the onset in the coda, but labials can be uh, palatalized contrastively only in the onset. So when labial palatalization is lost, sometimes it's just lost. Um, there, there are dialects of uh, Russian, for example, where that's true, or uh, sometimes it's argued to be reanalyzed as a labial followed by the glide. Yeah. So people say that for um, Polish, uh, and they say it for Scottish Gaelic sometimes too, but I, I would be happy to hear from our colleagues at Arizona about how they feel about that. So Kochitov, uh, in a series of works, argues that the contrast tends to be lost in contexts where it is perceptually weaker. So he was inspired uh, by work by Styriata on the PMAP and uh, related ideas. And he showed that Russians uh, misidentify the, the four sounds you see here more often in the coda than in the onset, and that the listeners misidentify the palatalized pia most of all in that position, uh, and they confuse it mainly with the uh, the plain P. So that could be a sort of perceptual uh, correlate of this typological fact. Well, like Russian, Irish supports a palatalization contrast across its entire phoneme inventory, as I said, and in codas as well as onset. So it seems like an ideal language to sort of explore these ideas um, in addition to Russian. Uh, in earlier work, Maureen Ichisoyen and I um, did some perceptual experiments using speeded AX discrimination tasks. And one of the things we found in, uh, in both papers was that uh, uh, listeners are um, more uh, accurate in um, uh, discriminating the contrast when the consonants are in onset position than when they're in uh, coda position. Uh, we didn't find so much of a difference between uh, based on place of articulation in, in, that, uh, in the 2012 paper. So uh, Kochitov has also looked at the, um, the, uh, art, the production of these contrasts using Emma, and uh, uh, he observes that the palatalization gesture of Pia is reduced and timed differently in the coda compared to the onset. Uh, and this is a potential articulatory contribution or, you know, uh, a precursor or correlate, whatever you like, to these perceptual and typological facts. So like, uh, so these are uh, diagrams from Kochitov's work. So here what we're seeing uh, is a consonant uh, in onset position, so a CV transition. Uh, this is the closing of the, oops, sorry. This here is the closing of the, um, the lip. This is a, a P, this is the constriction, and then the opening is over here. And um, the bottom line is the, um, the constriction uh, of the dorsal gesture, the palatalization gesture. And as you can see, the constriction is maximal um, around, it's closer to the end of the uh, consonant uh, where it's uh, gonna be opening than to the beginning of the consonant. And this is something that, so Kochitov highlights that, 
uh, palatalization in Russian seems to align with the release um, or the offset of uh, the consonant. Uh, this shows um, shows the same thing for a couple of speakers uh, in a different way. So the comparisons, so these are two different speakers. The comparison is between uh, the, the simple line is um, the palatalized P in onset position. So you can see in the legend there on the right that the string of segments is the same, but what is being compared is a pia versus a p a. So coda versus onset. He used nonce words uh, for these experiments. The solid line is the onset, and the, the line with the little squares is the coda p. And uh, it's confusing, but the lower the line, the fronter uh, the gesture is. So this is looking at the dorsal gesture, and um, it's kind of upside down. So what you can see is that uh, in the case of the um, onset pia, the maximal frontness is aligned with the release of the consonant. So that's the low part of the plane line. And for the other line, which is the coda pia, the maximal frontness is aligned with the closure of the consonant. Um, so finding a difference for onset versus coda consonants, in other words. Uh, an onset position aligned with the release uh, and coda position aligned with the start of the consonant, more or less. If anything isn't clear, please feel free to sort of interrupt and ask questions. So what would be the reason for differences in timing in onset versus coda position? And we're entertaining, we don't have answers, we're just entertaining ideas right now and thinking about it. Um, there are There is a line of explanation that you could say is purely articulatory. Um, so there are uh, works that have um, suggested or argued that the timing of uh, uh, gestures in onset versus coda position um, are systematically different. Uh, in onsets, there's a close coordination and simultaneous articulation. I think that's best kind of best known in the case of just thinking about vowels and how they're coordinated with consonants. Uh, which I'll talk about in a minute, but it, it's common to point out that uh, the vowel and the consonant seem to gesturally begin around the same time in the case of onsets. But it's different in codas. There's a suggestion um, based on various works, not just vowels, but secondary articulations um, uh, like uh, velarization and um, nasality, uh, suggesting that the uh, there might be a more sequential uh, articulation with the, the uh, consonant uh, primary constriction coming later in the coda and possibly a looser coordination, so more variability. So for example, uh, this diagram, uh, it just shows a gestural score uh, for bad and just thinking about, I guess it's bad, uh, thinking about the um, timing of the, the, um, the two consonant gestures with respect to that tongue body gesture. The palatal wide is the a, ah. And the labial closure and the vowel gesture, as you can see, began at the same time. But the the um, the coda consonants, uh, consonantal gesture is uh, more sequentially coordinated with that vowel. Uh, in the case of uh, L in English, which has been pretty extensively studied, and on, so there's a dorsal gesture. We know that L um, involves a, a kind of velarization like dorsal gesture, even an onset position, there's some of that. But an onset position, it tends to be simultaneous and pretty tightly coordinated with the, um, the coronal gesture. And that's what you see in the, uh, the diagrams at the top and the bottom. So alignment in the top and in the bottom, you see um, uh, the, the, as the tongue backs, this line uh, dips for the L on the top, the tongue rear. And that corresponds more or less to the peak of the tongue tip gesture where it's making its constriction. Is that clear? And that's, what you, that's what you see in the, uh, the little box we stuck in there. But for codas, uh, there's not the same kind of alignment. So the, um, the, the dorsal gesture comes first and that's what we're seeing here. So in the diagram on the bottom, uh, the, the dorsal uh, backness peak is reached uh, earlier uh, than the peak of the tongue tip gesture. 
And that is uh, supposed to um, be a good part of the reason why um, L sound dark in that position. And this is a diagram that the main point of this diagram, um, the, the, the y-axis is the, the delay between the tongue tip gesture compared to the, the dorsal gesture. And so the higher you are up there, the more delay there is and the more you're, you're basically a perceptually velarized L and you're more likely to come from a coda position. So the velarized Ls are at the top and the, the, not, the, uh, the onset not velarized Ls are on the bottom. And what you can see is that there's much more variability as well and, and um, related to duration in this case in the top of the graph. So variability in the timing of the dorsal gesture in the coda. So different timing, more variability. So um, maybe that's a thing, right? There's some sort of articulatory, you know, inherent law about, you know, how these gestures have to be coordinated. Um, but another possibility that we're thinking about is that there are perceptual and acoustic factors that are driving this and the articulation is sort of serving those needs. Uh, so uh, important cues to the contrast uh, the palatalization contrast include, of course, the formant transition. Transition is really important. So for onsets, that's CV transition. For codas, that's VC transitions. And then the other big one is the um, what's happening when the consonant is released. So any burst or aspiration like noise and the shaping that happens to that um, because of the palatalization difference. Um, differences in amplitude and, uh, and uh, center of gravity, things like that. Uh, and then also uh, in the case of, we're not going to talk about this anymore, but in the case of certain constants like fricatives and possibly nasals, um, there are uh, consonant internal cues to um, palatalization. We're going to focus on the first two. Well, so the observation is that for onset cons uh, consonants, the uh, CV transitions and the release coincide at the end of the consonant. Uh, but for coda contexts, the VC transitions and the re release don't coincide. So uh, if they're both important to perceiving the contrast, it sort of raises the question, how should you coordinate the uh, palatalization or velarization gesture with coda consonants? Do you lean towards the, um, the transitions? Do you lean towards the release? Um, do you try to find a compromise between those things? So maybe variability could um, result from things like that. So this may predict manner-based differences in gestural alignment. So for example, we might expect that alignment in stops versus non-stops would be different because stops have releases and bursts and um, you know, fricatives don't and nasals don't. Um, also, there might be place-based differences. So labial stop releases are weak. They're, they, they're low amplitude and um, also less well-shaped by the, contra the, the palatalization contrasts. So from our previous work, we know that, uh, uh, and we looked only at onset consonants in that earlier work, we observed that for palatalization, the, um, the peak of the gesture did in fact correlate more or less with the release of that consonant. So as, uh, as is the case for Russian. So you see that here, the three lines are now uh, time points. Uh, so the beginning of the consonant, the midpoint and the end, I'm going to try to avoid saying onset for, for this because we're talking about onsets and codas, and that just gets really confusing. So I'm mostly going to say something like the start and the end of the consonant. But you can see that the peak of the palatalization gesture is at the end of the consonant there, that, that little dashed line. And that's especially true for palatalized, palatalized consonants. For velarized consonants, um, it wasn't so much true. So here you see it happening, but the difference between the beginning and the end of the consonant is not so spectacular. And sometimes it's, there's nothing much there at all. So this is also uh, velarization uh, over time points. So we found systematically that uh, you had this alignment for palatalization, but really much less clear in the case of velarization. That's something we're wondering about. So what about in the coda in Irish? Well, we, uh, we haven't had data on that before. So uh, now we do. So I'll describe the study. And when we get to the results, I'll hand it over to Grant.
Um, but so our research questions are, so comparing onset and coda position and thinking about these typological asymmetries, are the magnitudes of the secondary dorsal articulations and so the resulting contrasts comparable in each position or are there differences in the magnitude of these gestures and onset versus coda? What about the gestural timing? Does it differ across these positions? And uh, not only does it differ, but third, third bullet is, um, is there more variability either in the gestural timing or in the magnitude of the gestural peak um, by position? And uh, we're also interested in whether co-articulation with neighboring vowels might vary depending on the position. Um, co-articulation with the vowel is just one source of potential variability. So it's a special case of uh, what we already said. Uh, we happen to find really very little uh, effect of vowel on these gestures in our earlier work on Irish. Uh, but we were only looking at onsets. If we think about place of articulation, do we see any uh, asymmetries uh, like the above, depending on place, so labial versus non-labial, or simply based on uh, uh, secondary articulation itself? Are there systematic differences in uh, palatalized versus velarized consonants, depending on position? So we, had, we have eight speakers. They're professional broadcasters from the three major dialect areas. Uh, as I mentioned, only some of them being reported on here. Uh, we used a Terrason T3000 system with the probe you see here, and uh, subjects wore the, the headset that looks like you're a victim on a Saw movie where you kind of screw it on and hold the probe. Uh, so th that got us good. Um, we've had good results with that in terms of um, not having to do a lot of correction. Um, the target consonants were um, the stops uh, shown here. We varied um, voicing not um, as a factor, but opportunistically, just so that we could have real words in all conditions, uh, just assuming that, uh, and we have reason to assume this based on prior work, that this difference in voicing or aspiration doesn't have a big effect on um, how palatalization is realized. So varying place of articulation, labial, coronal, dorsal, whether it's palatalized or velarized, whether it's onset or coda, and we had three uh, vowel contexts. Uh, intending to be basically like e, u, a, but uh, these are the long vowels, and in the case of Irish, the long a is more like a. Five repetitions of each, uh, one per block, and they were uh, randomized within the blocks, and they were in this carrier phrase, dur chifa blank anura, so uh, ifa said blank last year. Uh, we captured the tongue surface using edge track. Um, we are going to show lowest curves. So instead of SS and OVA, that's what we're doing now. Lowest curves to show the overall tongue shapes uh, by subject and condition. Uh, but another thing we're analyzing is the just the highest point of the tongue. Uh, uh, so some of our analyses are based on that. And the diagram on the right just sort of shows um, what we mean by that. Uh, the highest point of the tongue pretty much across all of our data was um, always seemed to be uh, an appropriate thing to be measuring. So it wasn't the tongue tip, for example. Um, and sometimes it was a plateau. And so we took the um, center of that plateau. All right, I, I think I'm turning it over to Grant now. And I think I have to stop sharing and let Grant share. Okay, let me get stuff arranged here. Okay, everyone sees that okay? Good, good. Okay, so, so let's look at, um, at how, what, it, what we found. Okay, so we're gonna start off talking about the um, robustness of the contrast across different contexts. Um, so again, we're looking at the uh, lowest curves here. Um, and just like the other diagrams we've seen, um, the front of the mouth is to the right, um, the back is to the left. Um, so this is this these first this first um, set panels here are showing us the um, the labial contrast uh, before the vowel e. So this is onset p's essentially. Um, we see exactly what we would expect to see, which is a nice contrast between velarized and palatalized contrast here. Okay, so we have the uh, 
um, velarized uh, are backed and the palatalized are fronted. Um, and if we move on and look at the coda version of this contrast, um, then this specifically is the the end or the release after the constant or if the vowel, sorry. Um, we see that for a couple of the of our participants, we see that a main maintenance of that contrast, but we see it collapsed for two of the other participants. Okay, so in Coda, these differences are smaller for some of these speakers. Okay, um, and then if we look at um, the start, so the, this is the VC transition um, after the vowel. Uh, what we see here is something very similar, in fact. So for our two participants who showed the collapse of the contrast, we see that there. But then we see that for the um, uh, other two speakers, we have a nice maintenance of it. So basically what we saw before at the um, uh, end of the consonant is true at the start of the consonant. Okay, we're gonna look at this in a little more detail with a, a different measure. Okay, um, so apologies for losing a couple of participants here. Um, uh, data is still, data, the data is being annoying, um, but what we can see here for the alveolars is that uh, the onset alveolars, we have both the, um, a, uh, both of our participants here are showing the contrast with the, as in the expected direction, where the velarized and palatalized are neatly separated in terms of tongue contour. Um, if we look at the coda version of this at the release, we see that they're still maintaining it. So this looks much like the onset ones. Um, and then if we look at the VC transition, so the start of the coda consonant, uh, we see essentially the same thing. So it's continuing. Okay. Let's look at the codas in terms of vowel context. So what we're seeing here now is the, uh, these are all velarized um, tongue contours. However, we are varying it by vowel. So vowel context, the vowel leading into this consonant. Um, and we see quite a bit of variation and it's systematic. So we're seeing that the um, vowels having an effect on the tongue shape here with the front vowel pulling the tongue a little bit further forward. In the VC transition, that is also still true. Okay. Um, so we're not seeing an asymmetry in terms of the codas in re relative to the timing of the tongue gesture. Um, but again, we can, we can measure that a little more precisely if we look at the time points uh, or at the height of the uh, tongue, which we'll cut, get to in just a second. Okay. Um, what about the alveolars for the same situation? Here we're seeing in these coda alveolars for um, the velarized, we're seeing again a difference. It's much smaller than it was for the um, uh, labials, but we're seeing at least possibly some evidence of vowel influence on these codas. At the start, we see the magnitude is, looks a little bit larger. Um, and let's look at uh, the dorsals. So for the dorsals, uh, onset um, palatalized versus velarized. Uh, again, we see a nice contrast for the two speakers that we have um, full data for right now. Um, and if we look at the uh, transition here, we see that we do not get that nice uh, contrast. Okay, so instead we see that the tongue shapes are more, much more overlapped. If we look at the release, um, so this is the end of the coda consonant, we see a bit more separation now. Okay. So this contrast seems to be a bit more robustly realized at the consonant released, which is a little contrary to what we might have expected. Okay, so let's summarize what these tongue shapes are telling us in this 
burst analysis. So the onset data for labials and alveolars show the expected lingual differences. Labial and dorsal codas show smaller differences for some speakers, while alveolars show relatively strong differentiation. And we get more uh, variation by vowel context for labials compared to the alveolars. Okay. So this is going back to the other analysis that Jay mentioned, which was we can measure the um, highest, the backness at the highest point of the tongue. And this is a, seems to be a pretty good measure for this, um, this type of contrast. Um, and we have this data for the start, middle, and end of each consonant. We're mostly going to look at start versus end. Okay. And we can compare the syllable onset data with the syllable coda at the start of the consonant. So basically the VC transition where we expect most of the action to be happening. Okay. So this first figure is showing us the backness. The data points are um, jittered here. Um, so you don't, don't worry about that. Um, but what we're seeing here is the backness by velarization and palatalization. So velarized consonant in uh, darker, the darker boxes, the lighter boxes are the uh, velarized ones. And as you might expect, the velarized ones are um, lower here. Uh, so we see a nice separation in the onsets. So the onset um, differences here are larger. In the coda, we see a little bit smaller. Um, the, the boxes are not as far apart here. So what we're seeing is that the velarized palatalized difference is smaller. Okay. Um, arguably, there is also more vari variation happening here, especially in this velarized um, uh, time point. Okay. Okay. Um, if we look at the data across place of articulation, so again, same thing here, where our palatalized is in the our palatalized consonants are the darker boxes, lighter boxes are the velarized ones. Um, we see the sort of interesting um, decline in the degree of contrast here. So how far apart um, these are, the consonants are in backness. Okay. So what we're seeing here is that the labials are showing the greatest separation. So the difference between the velarized and palatalized is, um, excuse me, am I, sorry. Sorry, Grant, it's the coronals that it's show the, coronals. the greater separation. Yeah, yeah, the coronals are the ones that are showing the greater separation, possibly because there's less variability here. Sorry, I got I got myself confused here. Um, uh, and then what we're seeing is that the labials and the dorsals are showing a roughly similar amounts of difference here. And the labials show the largest degree of variation. Okay. How about another way to gauge the degree of contrast? Okay, so this is um, a measurement called um, the RMSSD, so root mean sum of squared distances. Um, the way to think of this is that we can calculate the dif difference from the distance from one contour to the other contour um, by comparing similar points. Okay, so um, we have if we have two contours like this, which have different numbers of points, depending on um, how the image came out. Um, when we compare, for instance, these, this blue contour to the red one, um, we compare each point to the nearest point on the other contour, okay? And this gives us an overall distance if we do a classic root mean square type distance. Okay, so then for the red contour, which has fewer data points, um, we're again comparing to the nearest, okay? Okay, so if we look at these similarity scores across the uh, matched velarized palatalized um, pairs here, what we see is that, well, it's a bit of a mess. I'm just gonna say that for this, 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 this graph. There's some interesting things that I think we should take out of this though. So for instance, overall, the dorsals are a bit more clustered. You'll notice that down towards the bottom here suggests that there is very high similarity, right? Um, what we see is that for the coda labials, we have 
points that are relatively low here. So contours that are essentially very similar to each other. And then for the dorsals, we also see some very low ones. Whereas for the coronals, again, we're getting a fairly large um, degree of difference. Okay. So differences in backness between the um, palatalized and velarized are smaller in codas compared to onsets. Uh, the vowels show more influence in the codas and the labials are more variable overall. Okay. Okay. So this is now we're going to try and more directly um, compare our work to Kochetov's. Um, and keeping in mind that while we don't have, for instance, those nice Emma um, uh, trajectories, uh, we do have um, our data points at onset versus coda or uh, 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 beginning and end of the consonants for their um, the height of the end of the sorry the highest point of the tongue and its backness right so we can compare these things um, so it's not identical to Kochetov's data but it's very similar okay so for onset consonants in both Irish and Russian the palatalization gesture peaks around the end of the consonant. Just reminding you of that. For coda consonants in Russian, there's more variability in gestural timing with the palatalization gesture peaking before the start of the closure, okay? Uh, we do not have data or we have not talked about this yet. This is stuff, this is our sort of, our, this is our new data that is going to help us out here, okay? Okay, so let's start off. We're gonna talk about labials here because we have an interest in labials because they are showing, um, uh, typological asymmetries. Uh, we have onset versus coda data, velarized versus palatalized, and we have the start and the end of the consonant. So the start of the consonant versus the end of the consonant, start of the consonant versus end of the consonant. And what we can see is that Irish is right now behaving, according to this data, behaving similarly to what Kochetov showed for Russian. Okay, so we have um, differences here in the onset, whereas in the coda, these differences are disappearing. Okay. Um, another way to think about this data is that we can compare sort of relative from the start to the end of the consonant um, tongue peak backness. So are we getting this, this skewing where um, at the um, start or end of the consonant, we're getting the peak of backness? Okay, so for our labials, what we see here is that we do get this skew, okay? So we have the onset palatalized velarized labials have peak dorsal gesture aligned to the consonant release, okay? And the, the palatalized skews fronter at the release and the velarized skews backer at the release. This is what we would expect to see. Okay, notice that for the um, coronal and for the dorsal, what we see for the um, palatalized consonants is the release alignment of the gesture here is, um, sorry, it is, uh, <laughs> it is skewed slightly, okay? If we compare this then to the velarized one, we lose that skewing, okay? So there doesn't seem to be much differentiation between um, start and end for the velarized ones, okay? So I'm actually gonna compare these again. I think it wasn't very clear there. So this is showing us that we get the skew that, um, that we might expect to see in the palatalized, we lose it in the velarized, okay? How are we doing on time? Okay, um, if we look at, um, the overall onset um, situation here. One of the things that we've, you could expect is that the release alignment for the onset um, should enhance both burst and format transition cues, right? So when you release the consonant, that's when you're getting the burst. We want all this stuff to align to get the maximum um, contrast 
Arguably, this is most important for the labials, right? Because the labial bursts are quieter, they're less affected by the, um, the distinction here because it's primarily driven or it's essentially driven by the um, lingual um, constriction. Um, and this is essentially in alignment with some of the work of my colleagues here um, on perception. Um, Whereas for why are these, why are the, what's, what's going on with the velarized here? So arguably um, the velarized are lingual. They're tied to the, basically the place of articulation and the palatalization velarization distinction is all done by the same articulator here, right? Whereas for the labial, you can separate these things out, okay? So the palatalized versus velarized involve changes in primary place. Um, for coronals and dorsals. Um, but what, the, what do we say about this? So the um, palatalized constrictions seem to continue fronting after being formed, okay? Whereas the velarized do not. Oh yeah, Jay is adding a helpful, uh, helpful comment for interpreting these graphs if this isn't clear, and I, I apologize if this is, hasn't been clear. Uh, for palatalization above the line means aligned with the release. For velarization below the line means aligned with the release. So basically at the line means there is no variability in how the alignment is happening with respect to um, closure versus release. Okay, for the CODAs, Notice that basically across the board here, we are not getting this asymmetry. And for the um, labials, what we're seeing is um, one high degree of variability. And again, we're seeing to the extent that we're getting any skewing, it is perhaps towards the, um, the VC transition here. Okay, basically high variability for the labials and the codas. And overall, like I said before, there's limited evidence for consistent dorsal peak alignment in the coda position. Okay, so let's, uh, let's talk about what's different about codas, and then maybe we'll get to an overall summary here and get, then we'll get some, some questions or get help some discussion. Um, so what's different about codas? Um, Dorsal gestures are coordinated differently and more variably with CODAs for articulatory reasons. So we have an articulatory explanation. Um, or since VC transitions and release don't coincide in time, perhaps there's competition over which cues are prioritized by alignment of peak dorsal gesture. Okay. So we find that the velarization palatalization contrast is indeed smaller and likely more variable in magnitude for CODAs and for labials. Velars also have a smaller magnitude compared to coronals. Uh, we also find that secondary articulations are more ambiguously timed with respect to primary um, uh, gesture and coda position. And we also find this for velarization almost everywhere. Okay, these asymmetries correspond well to asymmetries in typology of the contrast. Perception of the contrast. And also strongly suggests that the typological facts are rooted in both facts of perception and production. Um, arguably a chicken and egg situation where it's hard to know what's driving what. So do the perceptual, so let's, so arguing a little more broadly, do the perceptual characteristics of coda consonants stem from their weak or variable articulation? Or are coda contrasts weakly, variably articulated because of their perceptual characteristics? Or is this just reinforce each other? Okay, maybe some balance of trying to keep them separate, they're collapsing over time and so basically a sort of constant chasing of the tail here. Um, so we have some open questions. Um, so lip rounding is involved in the contrast. We don't have that data here um, for uh, codas unfortunately. Um, so do we find onset uh, coda asymmetries with respect to rounding? Um, also, 
if we look at compare this to our previous study, which just focused solely on onsets, um, we found very little evidence of CV co-articulation in that study. In this study, we're finding some evidence of it. Um, in the previous study, um, we found that lab the labial backness contrast was not as robust for coronals. Um, in this study, we're not finding that as strongly, if at all. So this is some things that are a little different from our previous study. Um, the challenge here is that the way we set up both studies is different though. So there are, uh, the methods, the items, the analysis techniques are pretty different between both studies. Um, so what's the right explanation for the onset coda timing asymmetry? These are open questions. Why is velarization more variable in magnitude and more ambiguously timed compared to palization? Need more study. Um, and overall, thank you very much. I'm gonna open this up for questions. Uh, I'm gonna stop screen sharing. Thank you to my colleagues. Thank you for a wonderful talk. Um, I, there are many questions in the chat. I, um, ah. I'm, gonna, I'm gonna just ask a, a data question. My iris is quite rusty. Um, the labialization, which you didn't, wasn't really the focus of your study. My perception of it when I was working on the language was that it was conditioned by the vowel that follows in onset position. Um, so you were more likely to get labialization with a front vowel um, than you were with a back vowel. Um, it, it, first of all, is that true? And secondly, um, you wouldn't really expect that articulatory difference to show up um, with velarization in the coda position, right? Because um, anyway, just just um, feel free to say, no, Andrew, you're crazy. <laughs> Um, Ryan is our maven of lip rounding in Irish, so, so if, if you have anything you want to uh, say, Ryan, please speak up. But um, one thing I want to know, Andrew, is whether that observation of yours was based on uh, really um, seeing lip data or just based on... So the velarization is also right much more audible before front vowels, and so I just wonder if we know whether this is really an, an, uh, more like a, an auditory thing or a, a gestural thing. It was based entirely upon me listening to speakers. I, no, no. Right. But it, it could well be. I don't think we know. But Ryan, do we have any way of knowing that? Um, we actually do. I'm trying to, I, I believe that the lip rounding that we found in our, our one of our earlier studies was comparable before E and U. And I'm just trying to verify that um, really quickly. Um, In a way, the E and U might not be helpful since U is rounded anyway. Yeah, so actually that is what, what, what we actually found, excuse me, is slightly more rounding before U than before E, which is what you would expect from the co-articulatory. So that might just be perceptual then thing. because you're hearing that rounding in front of a front vowel. It, exactly. Not hearing. Okay, very interesting. And but, with but you know what, Andrew, positions. I'd be interested in seeing like E versus A, ah, which we don't have data for, because you could be right for all we know. And just a quick comment on coda position. I mean, it's uh, it's true that we might expect something different there. I'm thinking about languages, though, that have contrastively labialized K or other dorsal consonants. And in a lot of those languages, labialization and coda position is really audible in the preceding vowel. So mm -hmm. it's it tends to not be aligned with the release and coda position, mm -hmm. but rather that VC transition in much the same way that we're seeing a secondary palatalization and velarization kind of shifting around their alignment with onset versus coda position here too. So like in, in Mesoamerican languages that have it, it's like, you know, thalk is really what the palatalized, or excuse me, labialized K sounds like in coda position. I think Anton had a question, or did he? We have a couple uh, I, from, I did, from Mike I too in the chat, just when we want to get to it. I do, but I, I don't know if I let anybody know that I had a question. So uh, maybe first Mike's questions and then I can ask mine. <laughs> um, Mike, uh, your first question might have, so yeah, the question was uh, inventory breadth of contrast connected yeah, with Sorry, the yeah, sorry, yeah. okay. Yes, awesome talk. That's my first question. 
Um, Thank you. And then I actually would like to like to usurp my own questions and ask a slightly different question, which is meant in total loving support. It goes like this. So the central thread is, you know, these contrasts are maintained on the left and ten, and in some languages tend to get lost on the right. And my question is, isn't that true for everything? That is, isn't it a truism of historical linguistics, right? That contrasts are preserved on the left and not on the right. And you've certainly given us, you know, sort of uh, uh, ideas about, you know, how these contrasts are being lost on the right. But the fact that they're being lost on the right, how do we know that this is different from other contrasts lost on the right? Well, I would say that, so you're absolutely right. For most yeah. kinds of contrast, that's going to be the way the asymmetry rolls, onset versus coda with coda losing. Um, there are exceptions, like the famous one of retroflexion that Stereata talks about. And I think the point of her work there uh, was that, um, you know, every kind of contrast has its own special, you know, phonetic properties and phonological properties. And so the why might be different depending on those kinds of things. So like, for example, the fact that voicing is lost in the coda, um, I don't think we're going to see a similar kind of explanation for that because I don't think that's about gestural alignment. I think that's about other things like the perceptibility uh, in that position. I could be wrong. So yeah, you're right. Uh, this is what we normally find. This is a special case of it. But we're trying to figure out what's going on in this case and not assuming that uh, it's for the same reason across contrasts. So there, uh, just to stick in a related issue. So I, th and this is one of the questions I stuck in the chat. So you talk about it in terms of onset and coda. And yet what you're really about, well, what it seems to be really about is whether there's a burst um, in the same place as where the format transition cues would be. And so I stuck in there something about CV, CV, and I don't know what Irish syllable structure is, but imagine that CV, CV, take looking just at the second consonant, that that second consonant need not be an onset. I'm assuming you would expect well, question, what, what do you expect about that, that middle consonant? Or what do we know about that middle consonant? Um, this question came up at UltraFest in November, and Moira was in the audience, and she spent some time kind of casting doubt on this idea that Irish puts those consonants in the coda. That I don't think there's a lot of evidence for it. But if it is true, like maybe, like it, as in English, maybe it can seem that way depending on stress or other factors. Uh, it's a really good question. We just haven't looked at it. That's mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. exactly the kind of thing I think we'd want to look at. It would be really exciting. Okay. Okay. Awesome talk. Awesome talk. Thank you. Thank you. Anton, did you want to ask your question? Um, yeah. Uh, thank, thanks for the talk. I was wondering about um, uh, vowel transitions, um, well, especially and not only in the cases where you see in the coda uh, the contrast um, merging, uh, appearing to be merging. I was wondering whether, you know, whether vowel transitions across the duration of the vowel um, are the same for, uh, for the, when, where the contrast is lost, appears to be lost, whether the transition with palatalized versus velarized um, are the same across the duration of the vowel. This is like, um, reaching that uh, point uh, with the same uh, progression. Uh, so like does, for example, does palatalization extend further into the vowel from the coda constant? Yeah, yeah so, something, yeah. Something. something like that, yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, one. I think one thing we can say is that we we do see effects in Irish of palatalization affecting vowel quality very saliently. And 
and I want to be careful about drawing conclusions because these things are like an opposition. So maybe it's the same thing as saying <laughs> velarization affects vowels, right, in a different way. But people don't talk that way about velarization. So, and we do, you know, and we we have found in Irish, and I think it's probably true in Russian too, that the velarization is very reliable. It does tend to be sometimes weaker and more variable compared to palatalization. So that could well be true. Um, uh, in some cases in Irish, the vowel quality completely changes. So it's like had become phonologized. So like um, I, uh, uh, the short ah after a palatalized labial is ah. Yep, thanks. Are you thinking that could help us uh, understand some of these facts? Well, yes, with, with, in, in terms of what's, uh, like, I, I was thinking whether the contrast might be still sort of mar marginally preserved in, in how the vowel behaves and, and that might um, help with the question of what's what's driving what but then sort of the thinking the thinking got, gets hazy <laughs> in the in the in the in that bit well thank you for that thought i, I would just quickly add that i mean a, a lot of the traditional dialect descriptions for irish you know regularly describe these diphthongs and triphthongs that are conditioned by both palatalized and velarized consonants N neither of which i mean which i've always thought is a mischaracterization of the facts and that these are really just instances of heavy co-articulation of monophthongs and diphthongs with both palatalized and velarized consonants and the fact that you do get these things like you know e is re really transcribed as ia before velarized consonants would suggest to me that that the velarized consonants penetrate, so to speak, the preceding vowel to quite an extent, um, uh, uh, similar extent to the palatalized ones, as Jay was kind of just pointing out too. Let's thank our speakers once again for a very interesting talk. And um, we'll hopefully see you all in the spring. We haven't set dates for our spring talks yet, but they'll that's coming soon. Thanks so much for having us here. Yeah, thanks so much. Really yeah. appreciate it. Thank you very much. It's and, fun to see you all. Cosmoros is a malagus condeniki for Cochebel. Some of me lean around of Nortas, Marie Huli Lemra, Marie Nil Shidilla, Hoton, Sevin Shield Rock, Snahomibo, Hilly Kilishti.